Captain Forest here, and in today's video, I'm going to be going over both these combatants to see who would win, more often not, in a cross-verse situation. Oblivion from Marvel versus Death at the Endless from DC Comics. Now, if you guys are new to my channel, please leave a like, comment down below, and of course, subscribe for further content. Also, I'd like to give a special shout out to Corn O'Keefe, representing the HQ squad and the Crusaders, of course. He was a huge driving force behind this matchup and the research behind it, so huge shout out to Corin. But yes, I'm gonna go ahead, start off with Oblivion and go over his scaling. Oblivion is a character from Marvel Comics. It is non-existence itself residing beyond the multiverse and all the abstract personifications that make up its totality. Now don't think badly of me, I can't help but wish for the end of all things. It's in my nature, my very identity, for my name, to some, at least, is oblivion. Before creation was, I was. Where creation ends, I wait. I am the void. The breath between life and death, between death and rebirth, the nothing, from which the everything springs. Oblivion is devoid of form shape, space, and time. Oblivion is where things that have ceased to exist, exist. Ever wonder where you end up after being killed by the ultimate nullifier? You end up in oblivion. If you look upon the true form of oblivion, then you would cease. One of oblivion's aspects is transfinite, meaning infinite layers upon infinite layers of infinite existence. This aspect of oblivion for an aspect of infinity and they battled on the highest level of reality conceivable. The Chaos King is only an infinitesimally small aspect of oblivion. The Chaos King scared Lady Death to the point that she stopped exerting her presence in existence. He is the entity directly opposite to eternity of the Seventh Cosmos. Amadeus Cho confirmed that the Chaos King destroyed 98.76% of the multiverse. Eternity contains multiple 1s aka extraversal realms transcending each other to a huge degree, with some of these 1s realms being their own transcendent hierarchies of power. Oblivion is non-existence itself and it is the final resting place of everything. Oblivion is a being without form or shape, a being without anything including dreams and mind, life and death emotions and soul. Death herself originated from oblivion in the end. Even death will find her resting place in oblivion. Peering into the oblivion for too long will harm anyone, including the likes of Lifebringer Galactus. Just glimpsing into oblivion causes a being to cease existing. Oblivion can erase the multiverse if he truly desired. Oblivion is unbound by the laws of everything. There is and there isn't. It is actually believed by the Zions that the primordial void is the Wuji. Due to lack of emotions, Oblivion values strong emotions within others. For example, Iceman was able to resist being erased from existence because Oblivion values emotions such as love. Oblivion cannot feel it, but Iceman could, so it allowed him to fight back and resist being erased. From the way the story went, it makes complete sense for Iceman to defeat Oblivion. Oblivion wanted to taste defeat, so it allowed Iceman to defeat it. But once it realized that no matter what it does, it can't taste defeat, it rose to its feet and overpowered Iceman. In addition, it is very clear Oblivion did not want to fight back. We've seen Oblivion straight up narrate an entire story and speak directly to the audience. Oblivion can see minds and twist them to his will if need be. Oblivion can absorb anything, be it life or soul, concepts or space, into nothingness, making them as if they never were. Non-existent physiology refers to the ability to lack certain aspects of one's existence, to paradoxically exist yet lack certain identifiable traits of existence or exist outside of a particular scope of existence. While true non-existence in the philosophical sense is impossible to prove, lesser forms of the idea appear often in fiction. Type 2, idealistic non-existence. The character doesn't exist in a sense further beyond conventional non-existence. In terms of binary, this would be something that is neither one nor zero, where one is existence 
and zero is non-existence. Characters of this type often have some degree of transduality due to their lack of binary existence. Characters of this type have to behave at least as non-existent as those with material non-existence, but might display even further showings such as preceding or opposing existence. Aspects of non-existence. Number one, spiritual non-existence. These are characters whose souls and slosh or astral body is non-existent. They are hence immune to regular soul manipulation. Conceptual non-existence. These are characters for which one or multiple concepts that are necessary for their own existence are non-existent. They are hence immune to regular manipulation of said concepts. Mental non-existence. These are characters whose minds are non-existent. Characters with this type are hence immune to regular mind manipulation and related abilities. Information non-existence. These characters whose information are non-existent. These refer strictly to the type of information that shape reality Type 2, they are hence immune to regular information manipulation. Number 5, lastly, others. These characters lack some other fundamental aspect that would be necessary for a normal being's existence or have a non-existent one. Examples would include things like lacking a history. They are hence immune to abilities that target that respective aspect. Oblivion has always existed and will always exist and is omnipresent within the multiverse as well as the void beyond it. Okay folks, that's gonna wrap up Oblivion. I'm gonna go ahead and move on to Death of the Endless to see what she brings to the table. Children of time and night, the Endless were born just as everything was put into motion. All of the Endless are personifications of the very laws of DC. Dream, death, destiny, despair, desire, delirium, and destruction. Death is the personification of all death and life. She is well known for being the opposite of what most people think death is like. Rather than being an ominous figure, she is a friend to all under her auspice. The endless are merely patterns. The endless are ideas. The endless are wave functions. The endless are repeating motifs. It has been demonstrated on more than one occasion that the endless explicitly not bound to one creation. When we need dream or destiny or death, we are only looking at one point of view. How can you kill an idea? How can you kill the personification of an action? The endless are not incarnations or manifestations of an abstraction. They are the abstraction in the most literal sense. Death exists anywhere that the concept of life and death exist. It's not possible to escape death, even by escaping the death of your entire creation into the overvoid. Lucifer himself told Silkman that death is inevitable and that escaping to the void or going to another creation isn't cheating death, but only prolonging the inevitable. Death is more powerful than her brother, Dream. Dream has total control over the dreaming. He straight up contains the entire collective unconscious the power of dreams can retroactively change creation and create gods. For example, the dream of cat story from Sandman, as well as the external forces described by the presence in the original Lucifer run. The collective unconscious is the universe's consciousness, a cosmic sea of symbols and archetypes, dreams and ideas made manifest. Santa Claus states that the mind is the source of creation. Another reference to the collective unconscious and power of belief, which is why his realm exists. I've talked about the main DC universe on this channel multiple times in the past, but it's time to go outside of the main DC universe and it's time to travel through the greater omniverse. There are infinite creations other than the main DC universe that together make up the greater omniverse but all the creations take up essentially none of the overvoid. Once a nameless, infinite, and eternal sea of perfection, the overvoid acquired consciousness and sentience after it became aware of the existence of a microbial infinitesimal flaw lying within its depths, prompting it 
to create a concept in order to contain it and restrain its influence and extend a probe from its non-being in order to analyze the flaw. Sentience is the capacity to experience feelings and sensations. The word was first coined by philosophers in the 1630s for the concept of an ability to feel, derived from the Latin sentientem, to distinguish it from the ability to think. In modern Western philosophy, sentience is the ability to experience sensations. If we're being honest with ourselves, the overvoid conceptually transcends an infinite amount of creations. Each creation, on its own, ranges anywhere from a few layers into high outer versal to a few layers into boundless. If you choose to go the high outer versal route, then the overvoid conceptually transcends high outer versal. This makes the overvoid itself boundless, but if we choose to go the boundless route, then the overvoid conceptually transcends boundless, which puts the overvoid at number four. What do I mean by number four? Well, I'm talking about a tier known as 1s. Baseline 1s, in this case, is infinite. You need a infinite amount of conceptual transcendences to reach baseline 1s. Baseline outer versal is number one. Baseline high outer versal is number two. Baseline boundless is number three, and so on and so forth. As I mentioned, the overvoid reaches number four if you go the boundless route for the infinite creations. The infinite boundless creations themselves reach number three. And if you go the high outer versal route for the infinite creations, then they'd be number two and the overvoid would be number three. Don't worry though, we're not done yet. Oh, you didn't know? Your ass better call somebody. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, the HQ Squad proudly brings to you the Leviathan of Stories. The Leviathan is an abstract entity from the comic book series, The Unwritten. It's the embodiment of the power of the masses and of the fictional unconscious, and it forms a symbiotic relationship with the world. It eats stories and in turn, these stories are sustained. The Leviathan has a special connection with the series protagonist Tom Taylor and is the source of Tom's abilities. The Leviathan of stories exists beyond the entirety of the rest of the DC verse, with the first part of it being one story, the Overvoid being one of those stories. This is then just part of an infinite hierarchy, which should all be just as complex, with each story having one conceptual transcendence within them, making the hierarchy of stories baseline 1s. After the hierarchy of stories exists, the Catacene hierarchy, which holds the entire Leviathan species, with, with the fry of the Leviathan species existing above the entire hierarchy of stories, and being able to destroy it themselves as well as being unaffected by its destruction, with the Catacene hierarchy hierarchy likely existing above them, in which the Catacean hierarchy is comprised of an infinite amount of whales with each one transcending the hierarchy of stories to a 1s extent, each higher whale possibly transcending the lower ones to a 1s extent with the Leviathan itself transcending the entire hierarchy. Now, let's talk more about the Endless concept known as Death, shall we? Death of the Endless can kill ideas. She can talk to the reader. The fourth wall is a literary term that originates from stage plays. Typically, a stage would be rectangular, so there would be three walls, one in the back and two on the sides. The fourth wall would be the edge of the stage that faces the audience, obviously, there was no actual wall there. The term fourth wall refers to the barrier between the audience of a world of fiction and the fictional universe itself. In most worlds of fiction, the fourth wall is intact. That is, the characters do not acknowledge the existence of an audience or that they themselves are part of a fictional world. However, some fictions employ the, the literary technique of breaking the fourth wall. This includes talking to the audience affecting the real world, quote unquote, rewriting speech bubbles, acknowledging that they are part of a fictional world, and even leaving the fictional work itself and entering the real world, quote unquote, represented, obviously, by a fictionalized version of the real world. Death of the Endless essentially has high godly regen. High godly regen entails the ability to regenerate after the erasure of a body, mind, and soul, along with a, at least one 
even more fundamental aspect of a character's existence, such as their place in the narrative, their entire history, or the underlining information type 2, or concepts type 1 or 2, but would only very rarely be number three if there is a strong evidence of being similar to the former types in terms of how hard it is to regenerate from them needed for them to exist. Death of the Endless herself, this cute little chick, is capable of absorbing souls. She can teleport others against their will. Death can also transport others to her dimension and travel freely to other realms. At the end of the day, Death of the Endless in general exists by necessity. The fact of being required or indispensable, they are significant and important, not just in the context of DC, but also in a philosophical context. The Endless are absolutely necessary before any human magical creature or god existed, the Endless were there as the personification of one of the vital aspects of life. More than a mere personification of abstract concepts, each Endless is the literal idea itself, making them immune to death or destruction. While even gods can be slain, a fallen Endless is merely replaced by another version of itself because DC cannot function without these essential concepts. So that's going to round up both these combatants. I'm going to go ahead and give my thoughts on who I think wins more often than not in a crossverse situation. Now, depending on what scaling you use, it can be the deciding factor of who would take victory more often than not in these situations. Now, if we use the higher scaling for both combatants, I personally lean more so with Death of the Endless. I think she has higher scaling, especially in the tier of extraversal. So I think that her abilities and all her prominent abilities and stats and hacks would put Oblivion in a situation where there's nothing he can do. As mentioned before, both of these characters are so necessary, so fundamental, they are extremely difficult to get rid of and extremely difficult to kill by their high godly regen. So I definitely see like Oblivion, he could come back and just keep coming back, but it just wouldn't matter because Death of the Endless would just put him in a comp compromising situation via being the dominant force in the fight. And of course, going off standard battle assumptions, if you are the dominant force in the fight, that basically means that you're putting your opponent in a situation where they can't do anything, even if the opponent can keep coming back, or you know, the opponent can't die, or you know, they just won't be incapacitated, it doesn't matter if they can't do anything to you, if they're on the losing side of things, then you would take victory in that regard, because there's many ways to take victory, it doesn't have to be by killing, through, you know, standard battle assumptions, it can be BFR, incapacitation, you know, different types of conditions to take victory, and this is one of them. So I definitely see Death of the Endless taking victory in that regard. Now, if we use, like, lower scaling for Death of the Endless, she would lose pretty easily. I see Oblivion, you know, being the dominant force in this situation, be a, a literal, like, 360. He'd, he'd be the one, you know, taking advantage of Death of the Endless, and there's nothing she can do in that regard, and I definitely see him taking victory in that avenue. Now, if we use like the more relative scaling, the more, you know, balanced scaling, it's honestly pretty difficult to kind of decide who wins unless we really dive deep and like dissect abilities, hexes, other things that could help, you know, either on Oblivion side or Death side. You can honestly argue Oblivion edging out more in the middle ground portion of the fight definitely they just keep coming back they can't kill each other you know they can't permanently put each other down they just keep returning because obviously they're just so necessary and they're high godly regen because of how they're like non-existent in a way or like how they represent their aspects and represent their concepts and how they're so needed and fundamental in that regard they both keep coming back so they can't necessarily kill each other permanently because they both have ways to come back and none of them have ways to stop each other from actually you know not coming back but you could just argue depending on who has the better hexes you know if you want to side with oblivion putting death of the endless in a situation where she can't get out that's totally fine or you could honestly argue the other side okay death might even do it to oblivion but me personally I think if we go off like the middle ground, the relative scaling, I think it's a stalemate per personally. I really can't see who would win in this situation based off just it being a complete stalemate. They're both so neck and neck in a way, unless you really want to, you know, dissect it and decide like who would truly win. That part, I leave up to you. But personally, overall, 
I personally have to lean more so with Death of the Endless in this matchup. I think that she does have the cosmology backing her in this situation. Higher scaling, higher layers, and just will be the dominant force and will be enough to defeat Oblivion. But yes guys, thank you guys for watching. Let me know your thoughts on the comment section. But yes, it's been real. I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.